So if you could uh, take your seats, please. We have also people connecting online. So welcome, good afternoon for a in-person hybrid debate on the tax reforms and Dutch perspective. Welcome, Marnix van Rey. Welcome also, Gracimos. Welcome, Elodie. Pleasure that we can have this discussion on what I think are is, is a very important reform on the table since the end of December, of course, being discussed much longer in the OECD context, about three or four years already. I mean, well known that we have this problem, I mean, related to a digital tax or how to tax the digital services business, an issue which the French have been insisting on since a long time, and some member states have acted in a disparate order, but then the Commission has come up with a proposal implementing the uh, or implementing in EU law the OECD proposals. We have Marix van der Rey, who is State Secretary for Fiscal Reforms, who will give a view from the Netherlands on this reform package, which is being discussed in the ECOFIN probably until today. Uh, was discussed also in the last ECOFIN. We know there are some problems with some member states having some objections, but as I just said to the State Secretary, I think I mean, six months would have been almost incredible to have it adopted, and we read in the newspapers today that it may take a bit more time. Anyway, the reforms are, I think, very important and very substantial, probably merit a bit more uh, discussion. Marix van Rey is uh, State Secretary today, was a senator before, but also worked for a long time in the um, private sector for Ernst & Young as a partner, also dealing with tax issues, has also been teaching these matters at the university. So he's extremely well placed to discuss this with us, which also is one of the problems, I think, for these proposals. They are difficult to understand. So uh, we hope, let's say, Marnix, listening to you, we will understand it better. And then we'll have Gerasimos, Director General from DigiTaxit, before and many other posts, very well known in Brussels, uh, also dealing with energy, because there is also an energy tax issue being discussed in DigiTax. So there is the CBAM, which is being discussed, but also before that uh, was a head of cabinet of our chairman, Joaquin Almunia, and Eli de la Mer, who is a journalist, specialized journalist on these matters. And then there should be some time for questions as well. We should end at 4 o'clock sharp, because the minister still has to go back to the Netherlands and uh, participate in the debate in this evening. So again, Marnix, welcome. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lano, Caro. Uh, first of all, I would not like to give the impression that I am a former professor in corporate income tax law. It's true that now and then I gave lectures at university, but the corporate income tax has, is so complicated in order uh, to become a professor there, it's better to be a retired politician, so maybe in the future. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. To avert the risk of a new economic financial crisis like that of the 1930s, comprehensive cooperation between the countries and the regions of Europe is essential. This was also the firm conviction of Johann Willem Beyen. The question is, who was Johan Willem Beyen? For us, that's very clear. He was a Dutch banker who entered, at a later stage in his life, Dutch politics. And he was a non-partisan politician. And when the plan stranded for a political union and a defense union in 1954, the six founding member states of later the European Economic Community were sitting together, and it was Mr. Bayen, the Dutchman, who had written a memo. He discussed it with his colleague, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Belgium, Mr. Spaak, and with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Luxembourg, Mr. Bech, and they converted it to a plan, which finally also led to the surrection of the in 1957 of the uh, European Economic Community. 
And I mention this, his name today because um, this is exactly what shows in the history of the European Union, that always on moments of crisis, there's always found a way out, or politically, and I will come back on that later, uh, or through the jurisprudence. But first of all, you need to have a vision and a common ground. The importance of European and international cooperation to the Netherlands is beyond doubt. It is exceedingly important, and it was in the Bayern's er era, and it will be in now and in the future. Because today's problems are even more complex than the problems in the 50s and the 60s of the last century. They transcend the borders of a nation and of nation states more than ever before. The integration of national economies is far reaching. Goods and capital services are flowing across borders more and more quickly. Work is becoming less bound to a particular location. As we observed and are observing in the COVID uh, pandemic, the digitalization, which was already uh, coming, actually was accelerated due to it. But also climate and environmental problems demand international action. And it is here that the tax system can play an important role and should play an important role. Because tax incentives, tax policies influence the choices made by people and businesses. So taxation has become an increasingly important tool in our joint policy making in the European Union. To give just one example, environmental taxation. When I was a student at university in the early 80s, it was not a subject. It, it was all focused on income tax, corporate income tax, VAT, inheritance tax. And nowadays, could you imagine a climate change and climate policy without taxation? Environmental, if I would have to give an advice to students in which area they should specialize, I would definitely say environmental taxes. So the tax system plays an important role in the issues that affect us as citizens of the European Union. And these issues are not limited to climate problems, of course. The Netherlands, as I said, was one of the founders of the European Union from the early 50s on. But also today we see with the war going on in the Ukra Ukraine, how extremely important cooperation in the European Union is. And it is these people in the Ukraine we're striving to become a member of the European Union, which is underlining uh, the essence and the importance of the European Union now and in the future. And that brings also the current European Union closer together. And it was built on solid foundations because all of us know it. I think it was somewhere during the Great War, and I think after the Battle of Verdun, that Monet and a British diplomat started a correspondence, and they said, never ever such a battle, which is killing so many young and older men, and for what reason? So what about the idea to transfer the power related to steel and call to a supranational um, institution. So it's often also wars which, which, which actually causes paradigm shift, not only in, in a very negative way, I'm not telling about the destruction and the destruction which is taking place right now, but also how should a better world look like. And I really see that also in, 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 in why, why it is so important that tax, taxation, if you would say, 
what are the three major topics in the EU, and it's not because I'm a state secretary for taxation in the Netherlands, but what I just said about climate change, but the taxation is crucial. Later on this year, the Commission will come up with proposals about VAT and the digital age. Very important to optimize VAT revenue. In the Netherlands, we are relatively good at this, but not good enough. We still are missing out on 2.7 billion euros in VAT income. That's the VAT gap for the whole EU. That is 134 billion. Could you imagine that we even would be able to raise, let's say, to start off moderately, 25% of these revenues, and then later on to 50%. Then we are talking about huge amounts. And this is about today's union. It made sense at the start of the European project to agree first on the taxation of goods that could be treated freely in the internal market, the so-called customs union. And Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg already had the experience, of course, in the, in the Benelux, but also uh, in respect of excise duties. So that was basically the main focus in the 60s of the, the last century. And that was, of course, a necessary first step to enable the internal market to start functioning properly. Given the increasing mobility of capital, agreements are also needed on other taxes. I can remember very well in 1986 when the Court of Justice in Luxembourg actually ruled the first verdict in respect of corporate income tax, the Avar Fiscal verdict. And look what has happened since 86 till now. The court actually plays a pivotal role also. Um, and then of course, looking at the four freedoms, whether cor national corporate income tax legislation is compliant with, EU, with the EU treaty or not. But the last couple, let's say the last 10 years, that after the financial crisis in 2008, we all can remember what happened. The world was literally standing still for a moment in October uh, 2008 when the Lehman Brothers collapsed. And then we had the G20 meeting in London in April 2009. And one of the major subjects was then actually tax avoidance and tax evasion and transparency. And it was the OECD and it was then Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of the UK, who made that clear in his press release, together with then the President of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, that that era of tax evasion and tax avoidance was over. It all was converted. It was basically the OECD had to take the lead. The OECD took the lead, and it was converted to the Base Erosion Profit Shifting Program in 2015, and then the EU did something very important because multilaterally it's good to have the agreements, but in order to make it from soft law to hard law, the EU took over quite, actually quite a lot of the action points of base erosion and immediately transformed it in EU directives. <clears throat> I've been counting what happened between 2014. If you just look at all these measures taken for broadening the tax base for, for, corp for, for corporates in order to avoid tax avoidance, that's in total 14 double taxation treaties um, uh, two, and then of course a lot of measures taken for transparency and integrity. And that was also the turning point for the Dutch government. It was actually the cabinet uh, uh, Rutte two, we are now in Rutte four, um, which actually was governing from to, uh, 2012 till 2017, who said, we as Dutch should not only take it seriously, we should also uh, take a lead, not only in the implementation and in the discussions here in Brussels, but also uh, by considering unilateral uh, extra rules in order uh, to combat the tax avoidance um, by uh, multinational companies. Um, and that policy will be continued. That policy will be continued uh, by uh, also this, uh, this cabinet. 
Um, so, if you also look, I do, will do one step aside, that why is it also so important for the Dutch government, and actually regardless the composition of the Dutch government, that is Europe is so very important to the, to the Netherlands, like two other members said, but I'm standing here on behalf of the Netherlands. Because according to the Netherlands Bureau for Economic Policy Analysis, the trading advantages of EU membership uh, have added 3.1% of the Dutch gross domestic product on a structural basis. And that's a conservative estimate. So the Netherlands is one of the countries that have benefited and benefits uh, the most from the increased trade and investment in that one European market. This increase makes effective common legislation even more important. Legislation to ensure trade and investment is well regulated. And we do that, of course, for our economies and we do that for our citizens. It is important that we continue to make good laws and it is just as important that they are, that they are wor workable in practice. And here I have a concern. And it's a serious concern. I just have said that I, uh, that I really like um, the initiative the European Union has taken. And not only an, not only an idea and an in initiative, but it has seriously led to implementation. But by being so active as a legislator, then you still also have to measure, uh, is it, does it work? Is it enforceable? Are the tax capacity of tax authorities, is that enough? Is that really, uh, are they really able to execute what the legislator actually wanted? And that is not often a very popular subject among politicians. Uh, because politicians like to change the world by making new laws. But at the end of the day, companies and citizens will make the judgment whether it will work or not. And I think that that could be an, that is also an important subject to discuss here in Brussels. It's not a reason not to do things, but also to think how can we help each other in the European Union and how can we make sometimes the laws a little bit less complicated? Maybe after, after my small speech, we will talk a, a little bit about the technicalities of Pillar 2. Uh, Chairman, you already referred to that. It's, it's, uh, it is a, 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 a very, very complicated piece of legislation which, um, which we fully support. Uh, but which has a lot of consequences also for the capacity of tax services. And then I mentioned just very short, the point of IT. <laughs> I'll give you just one example. The Dutch tax service was one of the first tax services which was automated in a way that others said, wow, we even got prices for it. It was, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s. That's a long time ago because we are now confronted with the consequences of being the first adapter. We, we made our law so complicated, we have 900 applications that if we wanna make a really systematic change in our law, it, it takes another five to seven years to do that. That's not a popular message. That was a message also which we were given, uh, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance and myself uh, last week in finance, even about the temporarily measure. So there you see that we also have, um, in, in, in one way, what would you like to do and what is good for the citizens, what is good for the countries, but on the other hand, um, you have to deal, of course, with the reality of the IT systems. It's not an excuse, it's a reality. And that also has to do with priorities and investing in IT systems. Um, Making good deals on tax is important, as I just said, in the European Union, but they don't stop there. Agreements have to be made on a far wider scale too. Um, and then actually, if we look at the inclusive uh, framework, it's really incredibly, of incredible, uh, and I could not have thought 
that 137 countries agreed changes to the international tax system last year. So we have pillar one and pillar two coming. And that is a tremendously positive achievement. It will also change the way how we are looking at tax and double taxation. But when there is a minimum effective tax rate of 15%, then that as such is creating uh, a floor which makes it really unattractive for all kinds of cross-border tax planning where low tax jurisdictions are uh, included. We could not wait for that, so what we did actually in combating tax avoidance and the abuse of tax, um, we took uh, a couple of other measures. But before coming to that, I also would like to say why the 15% is also so, Im so important. It's also very important for developing countries. And the Netherlands have actually already designed a policy in the treaty net uh, for the double taxation treaties with developing countries from 2014 on, where we are willing to give extra benefits to uh, developing countries. 23 we have uh, identified in order uh, to make it easier or to enable them uh, more economic activities than what we normally agree upon in a double taxation treaty. But the 15% as such is also very important for the developing countries. Coming back on combating tax avoidance and abuse of tax rules, in the Netherlands and the rest of Europe, we try to create an attractive climate for investment and doing business. An economically powerful European Union occupies an important position in relation to China, India, and the United States. Solid foundations for work and knowledge are vital in the EU too. A strong basis also provides a breeding ground for new activities. And we need new businesses in the EU for climate adaptation and the digital transition. And of course, the Netherlands uh, had something of a reputation when it came to taxation and tax avoidance, I just mentioned that, and it is true that our internationally oriented tax system gave many companies scope to avoid paying tax. And there I would like to stress that by developing the tax system, we did that, of course, with the good intentions for the Dutch companies which were spreading the wings all over the world and in order to avoid double taxation, but it ended up that also other parties found the way to the Netherlands and the double taxation treaty network and our participation exemption and our rules for the fiscal unity and the fact that we didn't have a withholding tax on interest royalty uh, and dividends and that we had a tax uh, service where you could make tax rulings in advance. But we attracted a lot of money which was basically flowing through the Netherlands coming from uncertain desti uh, destination uh, or source and uh, flowing to a destination often in a low tax jurisdiction. And that has badly damaged our reputation because these flow throughs basically had no added value for the Dutch economy. And that is why we were so keen in the former cabinets and in this cabinet to avoid that, let's say, um, empty less uh, economic activities. And one of the measures we took on top of the EU measures and, and with the implementation of ATAP 1 and ATAP 2 uh, was that we introduced a conditional withholding tax on interest and royalties and we will do that on dividend as far as these flows end up in low tax jurisdiction. And we have seen in the most recent numbers that that it's the EU implementation of the EU legislation to start off with, and on top of that, the unilateral measures which we took, which have been very effective because the stream went down from 38.5 billion in 2019 to just under 6 billion euros in 2021. And basically, we would like to see that to go to zero. Um, uh, it is also recognized um, we are modest about it because at the end of the day, and I also said that in the Senate as a senator, just show the numbers. You have to measure. Only when you measure 
and when you see the numbers, you can see the effect of your policy. And we will continue with doing that. It's not that we uh, are very proud of ourselves, but it is just also to, to have an objective um, uh, view on it and to follow actually your own policy. And I would like to plead that that is also going to happen in the EU. In order to see whether the policy and the legislation is effective, it would be extremely helpful if we start monitoring it, if we start measuring it by the numbers. And then we uh, also, for that reason, we strongly support a joint approach which has been proposed by the, <coughs> the European Commission in the best way to tackle shell entities. So I really uh, call on my European counterparts to address this issue together in the second half of this year. Because payments can just as easily be channeled through other countries. And that is why the European Commission proposal to end the misuse of shell entities is so important. There can be legitimate reasons for a shell entity. Uh, for example, if you want to concentrate finance activities and if there is enough substance, but uh, comply and explain and share the information among the EU member states. Uh, because I just mentioned the unilateral measure in the Netherlands, but actually, preferably, we should agree upon it within the EU, because it doesn't make any sense if the Netherlands has, can now say, like I just said, okay, it went down 85%, but when it's channeled through another EU country, which is, according to us, not the case, but we have definitely do some extra measures there, then, yeah, then, the, then the policy works for us as a country, but not for the European Union. So the proposal is an essential part of international efforts to fight tax avoidance, and it has my wholehearted support. As I said earlier, the EU is shaped by legislation, political decisions, and the judgments of the European Court. Governments have an important role to play in this sphere, but so do businesses. We can devise the best legislation, but the businesses themselves also have a responsibility to shoulder. In the Netherlands, they took the initiative to uh, draw up a tax governance code, which was actually the, the one, who, uh, one of my predecessors took the initiative, State Secretary um, Menno Snell. And just a couple of weeks ago, they um, they presented their tax governance code. For me, it's actually very simple. Multinationals, multinational companies have to be very transparent about what their tax policy is. Where do they pay tax? In which country? Because they are multinational countries. For which tax? Corporate income tax, VAT, wage tax. Make clear what you are doing. In, and do that into detail. And it's NGOs who have started this debate. And look where we are right now in comparison to 10 years ago. I only see progress. Um, ladies and gentlemen, tax avoidance transcends to national borders. So measures to tackle tax avoidance must do the same. But this equally uh, to tackling climate change. We can do a lot for the climate through taxation. And I'm pleased to see that the EU also has high ambitions in this area. Europe should want to lead the way, and within Europe, the Netherlands wants to set a good example. It was already clear that we have to end our dependence on fossil fuels. The Netherlands signed the, uh, the COP26 in Glasgow last year. The war in Ukraine has <coughs> underlined that. In the Netherlands, we are looking at ways to stop giving financial incentives uh, for the use of fossil fuels. We can't do this alone. We have to collaborate with other countries. These aims are set out in our coalition agreement and in the EU climate policy as detailed in the Fit for 55 package. These are admirable ambitions for the longer term. But the war in the Ukraine is also compelling us to make agreements that are, are at odds with those ambitions for the short term, like opening coal-fired power stations or, and this is more my field, temporarily lowering uh, energy taxes. Uh, the, we did temporarily we decreased the VAT on energy from uh, 21 
to 9%, and we also uh, lowered the, uh, uh, the excise duty on uh, gasolines, of course, within the overarching EU frameworks. In the immediate future, we have to do all we can to try to avoid vulnerable households being hit hardest by rising energy bills. At the same time, the higher prices underscore the importance of the energy transition. Well, Mr. Chairman, this was my introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marnix and Ray, for this, uh, yeah, the wide range of issues you have addressed and also uh, this strong adherence, let's say, to what the EU is doing. But uh, probably, Gerasimus, you have some comments from, also from the ECOFIN today, but from previous ECOFINs on what's going on with the tax file today and how we're progressing, because there are some doubts whether we're sufficiently progressing. Okay. Let me uh, first of all uh, thank you, Karel, for organizing this debate. I want to thank the State Secretary, Marnix, for coming over here. I think uh, the first I would say we like the Dutch perspective, you know, from the EU. And uh, I think we like to have uh, uh, member states that are engaged, uh, as the Netherlands is, on these tax policy issues that are crucial to our future and they are engaged, uh, particularly Marnix, which, uh, uh, you know, I have met, uh, uh, you know, I'm also fairly recent in this position, but we uh, have uh, had several meetings with Commissioner Gentiloni, and uh, I think it's good that he, the, the, the State Secretary and the administration, they engaged with the Europe and the Commission on substance. There is no taboos in trying to find value added uh, for the tax issues and we do not only stay at the level of principles, um, uh, that we, this is competence of the one, of the other, and then we don't talk about things. So I think what is refreshing uh, in the, both from the political and from the uh, administration point of view in the Netherlands is that at least in the last years and in the current period that we live in, we engage on substance and we try to see what is the best way that we can find value added at EU level and help the member states where there are, uh, let's say, um, uh, cross-border issues. I think uh, um, it is also uh, important that uh, we work with the member states uh, uh, to find improvements in what we do. Uh, very often the engagement uh, with the Netherlands has been very, um, you know, constructive, particularly in the, for example, in the current ANSEL proposal that is being discussed, because we have constructive engagement, both before we made a proposal and how we can improve our proposal. So I think it is very good. We like the Dutch perspective um, the, as it is laid out. I think also looking at the results, we want to commend uh, the Netherlands for uh, uh, being active supporter both at EU and international level. It has been very important uh, partner, let's say, in the uh, journey that we have made to uh, approve the OECD tax deal at G20 level and uh, among the whole 100, uh, uh, almost 140 countries. Uh, it is important to have this engagement and also looking beyond, beyond your own borders. Uh, the minister mentioned the less developed countries, so we had to use our influence actively as EU or as member states. We had to reach out to convince countries why it is a good thing to join this agreement. And last but not least, uh, I think for us in the Commission, it is also evident in the progress that we have made in the last uh, uh, semester report, it is a very good practice uh, <coughs> that we have the withholding tax on interest and royalties. I think it shows the way on certain things that sh should happen overall. Um, now, uh, we have a lot of discussion on corporate taxation reform. That's what the OECD tax deal is about. We have uh, a heavy agenda on uh, VAT, um, you know, in the digital age, and which uh, we try to both facilitate uh, the life of businesses doing, uh, you know, working cross-border, 
So the VAT in the digital aid is a, a measure that will try to make it easier and reduce administrative burden and red tape for all the businesses, small and big, that do uh, business across different countries, and also it will fight uh, the VAT gap and the fraud. So I think we are well set uh, on in the area of uh, mm, dealing with the corporate sector. I think we are uh, well working together, um, but it's more difficult in the short term with the um, energy crisis that we have on adjusting energy taxation and um, uh, climate taxation, certain issues, um, um, you know, certain the direction of travel is very clear among uh, all member states on what we need to do by using taxation as a complementary tool to regulation and to the ETS in order to, to uh, 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 gradually eliminate fossil fuels. But in the short term, uh, we had this winter tensions that we need now uh, to short out and uh, move forward. And uh, uh, last but not least, we have to look at, um, uh, you know, different areas of uh, taxation that we have to uh, work together. It was mentioned uh, uh, by the State Secretary, the case of uh, working uh, from uh, teleworking from abroad and uh, issues in in personal income taxation where we see uh, certain uh, spillovers across the border. For the moment, they are solved on a bilateral basis, but there might be a need to develop our thinking uh, in, a, in a broader way. Um, I think that on the pressing question, Karel, he wants to know what will happen with Pillar 2 and Pillar 1. Things are going very well. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, six months, as you said, uh, it was uh, very ambitious. You know, sometimes you get lucky, but most times you get lucky when you are persistent. So I think uh, uh, we expect, I think the presidency gave, a, uh, uh, made the remarks as well, the Czech presidency considers that the issue of uh, um, you know, adoption of the Pillar 2 directive, it will be very high on their agenda as it was under the French presidency. Uh, we believe it makes sense. Uh, uh, it makes sense for Europe. It's a net revenue generator for Europe, uh, this uh, OECD tax deal. And uh, we see that all member states are engaged. And therefore, uh, you know, we have to find the political opportunity in the coming months in order to close this pillar two. Pillar one, I think you all know uh, that it's got a little bit of a delay compared to the original timetable, but uh, I would say also for very good reasons. We have now a new public consultation and this public consultation has to be seen as value adding. Uh, this uh, pillar one is a significant reform, reassigning taxing rights across jurisdictions. We had uh, the OECD, the, the, our people, the steering group, the member states, we have made a lot of work in order to design it as good as possible, but it became evident that, you know, the uh, value added of having another public consultation was very important. And uh, I think this, we should take the positive out of this uh, public consultation that it will de delay a little bit the, uh, you know, the, the signature of the multilateral convention, but at the same time, it will give more clarity and more benefits in the future. So I would say, again then, uh, we c in this area we concentrate on the uh, substance of the matter. I mean, we had, uh, uh, and we are very grateful to have open cooperation uh, with the Dutch government and some other European governments, because we do not know, let's say, directly as the Commission, which are the companies in scope the member states talk to the companies in spoke, the companies that are in their jurisdiction. But, you know, many member states have been taking a very constructive approach and engaging us, inviting us. And therefore, we also understand, you know, what are the issues of implementation. And I think that's why I say it's a positive value added in going forward. So I think we will do a good job in Pillar 1 and the overall timetable uh, of implementation that we have agreed at the ECOFIN Council for the end of 2023 is not at this stage disputed or in danger. It, uh, we do have everybody, every actor has to do some work and it has to uh, move forward. So uh, uh, 
I think the uh, direction of travel is, is uh, very clear. We are very happy to have uh, uh, governments engaging in a positive way uh, in, the, in, uh, in this area with us, governments engaging with all stakeholders, uh, making sure that we understand the dif differences that exist uh, you know, among member states, go deep on them and try to solve them when it's necessary. And um, I think that this can only be good, uh, good for Europe. I will stop here and uh, you know, in the debate. Yeah, thank you, Gerasimos, and good to hear that you uh, we will do a public consultation. We at SEPS have started a task force on this with uh, Vieri Siriani, also my colleague Apostolos is involved, has drafted the report. We will be discussing this this afternoon. But um, I pass the floor first to Elodie to raise some comments, and then we can open it up for questions with you as well. So uh, please raise, think about the issues you want to raise. I think there are many questions you want to raise. Elodie Lamer, who works for Tax Notes. Thank Elodie. you. Thank you for uh, inviting me, and thank you uh, to the State Secretary and the Director General for agreeing uh, to share the stage with me. Um, I will try to be short because I see that the time is running out and the State Secretary has to go. Um, I wanted to give a few uh, observations, an outside perspective on uh, EU cooperation. Um, you said that the Netherlands had uh, something of a reputation uh, during your speech, State Secretary, and I'm sorry I have to bring it up, but it's my job, I have to do this. Uh, there were reports, you know, this uh, Uber leaks of fires or papers, I don't know how we call it, um, but this morning shed a new light on tax cooperation um, involving the Netherlands. Uh, some of the allegations are that uh, when the UK and Sweden asked the Netherlands uh, to get some information on earning of drivers, um, they just refused to give it, or they, as it was quoted in the press, they give it their absolute lowest priority to give uh, those information. Um, so, as you say, it's not only about closing the loophole of the law, but it's also um, about implementation, I guess. And also it makes me wonder sometimes, because you know, there, there is a lot of, there have, there have been a lot of leaks in the past few years about uh, tax avoidance and so on, and it put public pressure on ministers to just adopt directive. And there is not this public pressure on VAT, and there was a, a text that was on the table uh, to close uh, the VAT gap um, put forward a few years ago, and there was no political will to just uh, work and adopt this file. So sometimes I'm wondering what if there is no public pressure and what don't we know already <laughs> about uh, the, the tax loophole and how, how they're used? Um, but you also say that the Netherlands changed course entirely a few, a few years ago. Um, and as you may know, last Friday, the Netherlands submitted their recovery plan, a recovery and resilience plan um, to the commission. And there is a lot on uh, aggressive tax planning tax planning in there, um, and I find it funny because in the Dutch press, the only thing I, I read was, was what was not <laughs> in, the, in, the, um, in the recovery plan, uh, the mortgage interest deduction. But in any case, um, when you read the recovery plan, you see that um, in some tax aggressive, in some measures, again, aggressive tax planning, you see that the, the government is saying this will address economic recommendation by the commission. And the commission had really hoped that uh, the recovery plans, money for tax reforms, would actually bring changes. Um, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, uh, to see what the commission will say about the Dutch uh, recovery plan, because there are a lot of measures um, for Ireland, for Luxembourg, um, the assessment of the commission was that the measures in the plan uh, were not were only addressing partially um, some of the some of the um, some of the uh, what is the word I'm looking for some of the challenges that those countries were facing. Um, so, of course, that the, the leverage was not really strong with Ireland and uh, and uh, other countries because the money that was um, promised to them was not. A lot, but uh, anyway. Um, another thing that I think is, is a bit striking when you want to uh, assess tax cooperation between uh, member states is actually the infringement proceeding uh, launched by the Commission. Uh, so I checked the website yesterday, hoping that it is up to date. Uh, currently, uh, in the active cases on tax, there are 160 uh, active cases, infringement procedure that are open, meaning that some member states have not implemented or only partially implemented uh, some pieces of legislation. 
160 uh, on tax alone. 160, treatment. yeah. But and all some countries, all EU countries. Yeah, 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 and some dating back from 2006. So it says that there are active cases, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, and when it comes to the anti-tax avoidance directive, so we have two tax uh, anti-tax avoidance directive right now, and I counted uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven member states who still have uh, issues with the implementation of, of the ATAD directive. Um, and I think, again, it's it's important <laughs> not only to make laws but to implement them especially since we agreed unanimously uh, to them. And this brings me to my uh, next case, is the uh, issue that is uh, high on the agenda right now, is the uh, unanimity rule um, for voting in the, in the council. Um, I mean, I've been covering taxes for 10 years at EU level, and I've seen many vetoes in the past, but it was the first time two weeks ago that I heard a tax commissioner saying, there is a breach of loyal cooperation in using tax veto to get leverage on something else. So <laughs> I'm wondering if, if the request by citizens to just drop this, uh, this uh, unanimity rule has been heard because the answers by both institution, council and um, commission was, we can do things with the treaties, with the, the current treaties because we have this password clause. I mean, <laughs> if you use the password clause, you need unanimity to trigger the password clause. How is it a good enough solution? How can you tell citizens that you can do it uh, with the current treaties when you actually need unanimity? So, And I mean, you, this, these tax issues actually have to deal with revenues of member states. So can you really use tricks in the treaties to, um, to circumvent the, the unanimity, uh, unanimity rule? Um, and there's also <laughs> another issue. It's not only about forcing uh, legal text to, uh, to some countries. It's also about the quality of legislation. I mean, we all cover, um, follow those issues really closely, and we can see a compromise proposal changing. You know, there is one, and then there is a second. And sometimes you see bits uh, in the text disappearing. And uh, I guess most of the time they are linked to... Uh, to legitimate concern of countries. But sometimes, <laughs> you know, I remember in the ATAD directive, um, the CFC rules were supposed to be uh, implemented, but not when you could see that a company had uh, economic substance, meaning staff, uh, premises, and so on. And there was one bit in the, in the text that was saying that the staff had to have a link with the revenues that the company was making. But this was, this was removed, uh, and you're like, why? Why do you, did you remove it? Because, and you know, when you talk to stakeholders, they say basically somebody can come and wash the window and it will be considered as, as staff. So it's also about the quality um, of, the, uh, of the, the text, I guess. And uh, what I understand is that since it, it touches upon tax revenues of member states, maybe there is not everything that you could do with unanimity because it's too sensitive. But what about cooperative administration? I mean, this does not really have an impact, direct impact on, on tax revenues of member states. So maybe there we could think about uh, qualified majority. Um, sorry. And then <laughs> since uh, it touches upon, sometimes my brain makes a difficult connection, but <laughs> I assure you that there is a connection. Uh, so I was mentioning that it touches upon a tax revenues of, of member states. And I think it's also an important <laughs> issue of, of cooperation between member states and tax issues because we, we decided that we would make a loan together. We have uh, borrowed 800 billion euros. I mean, in current, in current prices, it's uh, some somewhere around 800 billions. But there is no agreement yet on any own resource ex ex except the, uh, what people call the plastic tax, which is not a plastic tax because it's just a penalty contribution on member states uh, which do not recycle enough. So I think it's also a matter of, of good cooperation that we just, if we do expenses together, we find revenues together. And I don't know if any of you listened to the uh, ECOFIN uh, public session in June, but uh, the commissioner, the budget commissioner, Johannes Hahn, was really clear, markets are looking. <laughs> and it's not that our uh, triple re rating to borrow is, uh, is, at, is under threat right now, but uh, we have to show unity there. So, I mean, for me, that's, that's uh, an aspect of the debate um, 
that we should not um, forget. I have other points to make, but I think it would be better <laughs> to... Uh, yeah, but to I probably ask some, uh, if there are questions from the room before I go back to um, Gerasimus and Marnix van Rey. Anybody else? I mean, and there is a microphone or I can give you a microphone. Yes. And if, if you please identify yourself. Thibaut Gross, sir. Sorry? Okay. Thibaut uh, Gross, Deutsche Banking Association. Uh, I had a general question because the, 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 the clerks. No, okay. I hope you can hear me. Uh, so, so the financial crisis had been reduced are quite substantial. And I was just wondering, does it have any impact on Dutch GDP? Is GDP being reduced? And uh, what would be the consequence? Sorry, what was the first part of the question? D? So the substantial, uh, the, there have been a substantial reduction in the in the flows going through the Netherlands, like not. Okay, okay the minister referred to this, yes, yeah, indeed. So, so uh, uh, does that impact also Dutch GDP? Is G uh, Dutch GDP being reduced as a consequence? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for? Yes, next to you, please. Yes. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Christiana Levergori, and I work for Fleshman Hiller, a public affairs consulting firm here in Brussels. I have a very short question. Uh, looking long term. Uh, and it's addressed to the whole panel. Do you think that taxation policy is becoming increasingly part of the S side of the ESG, the social aspects regarding related to the agenda in the sense of companies having to pay their fair share? Uh, so is there a new momentum that comes from a new set of political goals driving taxation policy, which are related in the, these political goals to the S side of things in ESG? Thank you. Probably that was a uh, final question. I look around because um, there were many questions, but you all of them, probably you you may think, let's say, what is best for you to address and then what is best for uh, Gerasimus. Um, thank you. Uh, shall I limit myself then to three questions? Then we have a fair share. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say something about uh, mortgage, uh, mortgage deduction interest. Uh, uh, you, you made uh, that point um, uh, because it's also one of the recommendations in the, um, in the report, uh, the country report of the European uh, Commission. Um, I only would like to focus on the tax aspect of it. Uh, I'm not going to deal with the whole housing market in the Netherlands. But since 20 years, actually, uh, we have taken as Dutch governments a lot of measures which is limiting uh, the interest deduction. But we have done it in such a non-transparent way, and it's, it, it never had my preference, uh, standing aside in the private sector, because it was all type of political decisions. First of all, the duration, it's only 30 years. There it started in 2001. Secondly, if you sell your house and you make a capital gain, you basically, that capital gain should be used for financing the new house. So you don't have a mortgage, fully mortgage interest deduction on that part. Yeah, you also could have limited just very straight on forward. We didn't do that. Then houses above 1 million, um, you have to pay much more in the so-called fictitious income on the house. Basically, from one million on, it's seen as an investment, and it's taxes, taxes as an investment much higher. Then, secondly, we have two systems. We have the system in 2012, 2013, the old loans and the new loans. My children uh, would like to uh, buy a house and get it financed. They only can do that for the interest deduction on an annuity basis. In the past, we all had always these balloon um, loans. Um, and I can go on uh, and forth, but the most important one is interest is only, you can only deduct it at the rate of 37% and not at 49.5%. Uh, so what I <coughs> would like to do as a state secretary is to make an, 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 an analysis, has been, uh, by the way, done in 2019. I raised this subject also in the Senate just to analyze what is the tax treatment of the residential house and how can we make it simpler because it's a very complicated system. We did, we did much more than actually if you look from outside in 
and that is for sure no criticism on uh, European Commission or IMF, that, that's our own fault. Uh, and sometimes, uh, and, and that doesn't, and I don't want to say that we should do more, but in this coalition agreement we have agreed and not, not to do that, but we, uh, we have to make that uh, analysis. So that is my answer, and I think it's also an f example of bad, by several different governments, cabinets, it's a bad form of policy making. Because also in the execution, the citizen doesn't understand it anymore, Maybe they deduct, uh, sometimes they deduct too much without knowing it. And actually the tax authorities, the tax service also don't know it. It costs a hell of a lot of time for them to, uh, to, check, to check these tax returns. Maybe the most simple solution would be neutralize it. So don't tax the income, the fictitious income on the long term and uh, no deduction anymore in the future and say as a government, it's none of our business whether you buy a house and how you finance it, but it's not going to happen this term. I can tell you this is not a political statement, but I published an article about it in one of our uh, uh, magazines, tax magazines, already in 2007. Secondly, I would like to say something, of course, about Uber, because you asked that. Um, well, I'm, uh, first of all, um, I always take this type of uh, publications very seriously. Uh, so I'm not the type of person who immediately go into the defense, but I'm also not gonna say what everything was, was written, it's based on millions of emails, that is right. Of course I asked the tax service what has happened there, and uh, they have told me we have followed the procedures, but I wanna investigate that of course more. Uh, and I want to report that also to Parliament. Uh, we have the so-called secrecy clause, so I cannot say anything about a particular company in public or in Parliament, but what I can do in Parliament is uh, explain it, and then of course it's behind closed doors, because um, my, my whole style so far, and I want to continue with that, is Parliament, yeah, I've been a parliamentarian myself in the first chamber, it's the highest institution in the parliamentary democracy and they should have the same information as the cabinet, the government has. That is what I can say at this moment about it. And then the third point actually, um, uh, which I would like to say, I like the question very much about the ESG. Uh, I published about it uh, two years ago, three years ago. Um, and therefore, I also just raised the subject shortly about there is a big responsibility for companies to make clear and be very transparent about what they are doing. Um, I find a lot of companies the last 10, 15 years far too defensive as far as it is related about tax. ESG is a very important development, whether it's the S or it's the E, you also could say it's the G, it's the tax governments. So uh, I also wrote something then for the British Academy uh, two years ago, and, and actually I'm a strong uh, defender for that companies also use their ESG, and it's not only the board, it's also the owners, their shareholders. And you see a lot of good, examples there by institutional investors as far as related to ESG and also to tax. And it's not only the public companies, it's also the private companies. So that's uh, who, who should take their responsibility there. That's my answer on that question. Thank you. Um, I think on uh, a few comments on uh, um, the RRF of the Netherlands. Of course, we will evaluate it. The, the main issue that I would say at this stage is that there are no outstanding uh, country-specific recommendations for the Netherlands at the moment. But of course, we will come with the assessment of the uh, plan from the Netherlands. Definite VAT regime. I think we had a quite important uh, agreement now in December on VAT. It is not an agreement on the definite regime, but I think uh, uh, you know one of the characteristics that we should keep is to be um, you know innovative and look forward and not only look backwards. So we could not get the definite regime done. We got a good agreement in December. Now we have VAT in digital age. It might open new opportunities. 
and new ways to solve problems. Technology does not solve all the problems. So the digital by itself will not solve everything, but it will uh, create opportunities uh, responding to uh, the new economic realities. I think what I am convinced is that, you know, we have, uh, we had the single market for quite some time, uh, 30 years, it will be celebrated, uh, you know, this winter. But of course now with uh, uh, geopolitical events, supply chains are being uh, redesigned by companies. There was a recent survey uh, found that 54% of companies plan to move to near shoring next year. 10,000 companies surveyed. So there is uh, a lot of uh, going for sort of companies within Europe uh, working in different ways. I think the uh, climate objectives will also have an impact on supply chains and distances. And therefore we will try to build on that in order to move forward the VAT agenda. Unanimity, Commissioner Gentiloni has mentioned that we do plan, uh, as has mentioned the president, to uh, use Article 116 uh, um, when it is uh, properly, um, you know, justified uh, in order to um, address specific issues. And uh, beyond that, I think uh, uh, it, we take note of the message that comes out of the conference for the future of Europe, that there is a strong willingness of the citizens, uh, you know, to think, uh, to see certain aspects being treated by qualified majority. I think uh, the political timing is very important. Starting a procedure to revise the treaty does not uh, guarantee you an outcome. So I think uh, we have to use what uh, the instruments that we have, and then we have to move forward from there. Uh, but I think, uh, mm, you know, uh, our commitment to get uh, agreement in the short term among 27 is the most practical way for us by convincing businesses, stakeholders, the press, public opinion, that if the value added of doing certain things at EU level, I think that is our short term stronger, uh, you know, weapon to this. Thank you. So final question, what is the guess? When will the pillar two be adopted? Marnix or Gerasimos? Well, I'm very po sorry, I'm very positive. So um, we have now a recess coming up and I, I, I still believe that an agreement should be possible um, uh, after the summer. So I have a really good hope that at the next ECOFIN, not the informal one, but the formal one, and hopefully before we have uh, um, everybody on board put it like that. <laughs> okay, that was a clear answer, and with this, thank you very much. Or Gerasimus, you wanted to add something? Oh, I support. <laughs> <laughs> of we course. Are, we are on the same side in yeah. this debate. <laughs> Good, and with this, thank you very much. Marnix van Rey, State Secretary from Ministry of Finance. Thank you very much also for the cooperation and for organizing this with us. Thank you also Gerasimus for commenting on this. Thank you, Elodie. And thanks to all of you for listening in and for uh, participating in this debate. So we will follow this up. We have a meeting at 4.30 of our tax group. For those which are members of it, we will meet upstairs and we will discuss the report on these matters. But that's also thanks to you that we have a bit more time to finish this. So thank you very much and uh, see you next time. Thank you.